Hello, my name is Paul Bonaskovich. I'll be taking you through examination of the hip. During an exit clinical fellowship examination, not only will you have to demonstrate that you know how to examine the hip correctly, but you must ensure that the examiners are able to see and appreciate each part of your examination. It'll become immediately apparent to the examiners if you have a routine. And it's important to develop a standard examination system that is second nature to you. This requires a competency in your clinical examination such that the routine becomes a subconscious cortical act that you don't have to think about what comes next. This means that in the stress of the examination, your technique still flows smoothly and naturally and no steps are forgotten. Exam etiquette is very important, even for the short cases. As an absolute minimum, you need to introduce yourself to the patient, ask permission to examine their hip, explain that you're going to be moving their hip around, and if it becomes painful, that they're to tell you immediately and you will stop. Make sure that you watch the patient's face throughout the examination, avoid any sudden movements, and try and avoid toing and froing uh, between the couch and the patient. At the beginning of the examination, you may be very ner nervous and anxious, but it's important to take a few seconds to calm down and stay focused. Remember to listen to what the examiner says. Think about what you will find. Look as though you know what you're doing that you've examined the hip before. Appear confident to the examiners. At the end, don't forget to thank the patient and wash your hand between cases. Good hygiene is vital. This is all exam etiquette, and you should all know these rules, but it's very easy to forget them in the hurry to come up with a diagnosis. But if you don't follow these rules, you make it very easy for the examiners to fail you because it's easy to put down on the form was rude or brisk with the patient rather than looking at the, your core knowledge as a reason for failing you. So although examination of the hip is a continuous process, for ease of purpose, it can be bro broken down artificially into a number of different subsets. The aptly look, feel, move is appropriate. So we stand the patient up, inspection, luck, and we look, seem to be looking. We walk the patient gait. Chandelenburg test is next. We lie the patient down, palpation, Thomas test, range of movement, limb length discrepancy, specialized tests, and neurovascular status. We normally test for leg length discrepancy after range of movement, because if there is a contracture, we want to place the leg in a mirror equivalent position um, uh, together. And we won't know if a contracture is present unless we've previously tested for range of movement. So inspection from the front, I get the patient to stand up for me. Can you stand up, sir, tall and upright? And I looked at the shoulders, is the shoulders level? I look at the attitude of both legs. Is an external rotatory deformity of long one leg suggesting an old surfy deformity? I look and feel at both ISIS. They should be uh, level. I imagine a line between the two. Pelvic obliquity is present when this imaginary line is not parallel to the floor. Uh, the ISIS will be at a higher level with a fixed A deduction deformity at the lower level with a fixed A deduction deformity. At this stage, I ask the patient to pull their legs together and push their knees out. This may reveal a leg length discrepancy. And at this stage, I'll ask for blocks as a screening test if this is the case. Is there any thigh or calf muscle wasting? Is the patient taking weight equally through both legs? What's the skin condition like? Are there any obvious scars present? If there's a hallux valgus deformity or a lesser toe deformity, then I'll mention this, although it's not strictly related to the hip, but it would be daft not to do so. But I don't have a massive list of negative findings as this will end up using lots of time, won't score me any extra, mark, any extra marks and may irritate the examiners. From the side, is there an increased lumbar lordosis to conceal a fixed flexion deformity of the hip? I, I pull up the underpants at this stage and look for any sinuses or scars. A sinus is enlightening the exam as they're not likely to bring a patient with a 
chronic infection that's actively weeping pus out into the exam. With an arthroplasty scar, I want to be a little bit more uh, thorough if I want to score a six or seven. Is the scar from a hardened anterolateral approach or a posterior approach? I might ask the patient at this stage, if they're young and I'm suspecting that there could be other scars around that I'm missing, any other scars that I'm not seeing. There could be scars at the front because they may have had anterior surgery in the past as a, in the childhood. Again, I look at the legs. Is there a fixed flexion deformity uh, or attitude present? Uh, are the legs f f fully plantar grade and straight? From behind, is there a, is the spine is the spine straight or is there a scoliotic deformity? Um, if there is a scoliotic deformity, I might be again be thinking about uh, referred pain from the spine to the hip, I'll, and I'm higher order thinking that I'll have to put the patient onto the couch before I lie them down to see if the scoliosis corrects or not. Gluteal muscle wasting is strongly suggestive of chronic hip disease. I look for any alterations in the level of the popliteal folds. I look at the alignment of both lower legs. Is there calf or hamstring atrophy? Any hind foot abnormality? At this stage, I'll do a screening test of the spine. I'll ask the patient to bend forward. I'm checking the spine for symmetrical movement and normal rhythm. If the spine is stiff and painful, it again could suggest that pain is referred from the spine to the hip. I try not to examine in, in silence. I explain my examination technique as I'm going along. Uh, and at this stage, I generally perform, perform a mini summary of my positive findings on examination. So on general inspection, the patient looks well, is standing straight, shoulders and pelvis are level, both knees extended, and the stance is symmetrical. I, I succinct summary if it fits in well. Sometimes it's not appropriate because it's a fast paced, short case, and the examiners just want you to get on to the positive findings. So you've got to be a little bit, uh, uh, flexible with this one. Next up is gait. Uh, this is your last chance to check for walking aids or you've missed the chance to score your extra point. Get the patient to walk away from you and then towards you. Look to see if they're walking in a straight line and look at their shoulders. You have to recognize various different gait patterns. The three most important ones are the intelligent Trendelenburg and short leg gait, secondary to a pain, weakness and shortening. Be very clear about your definitions. Um, if you're unclear, and it's, then the examiners will pounce on you and ask you to clarify what you mean by saying an intelligent gate, and you'll lose some time and perhaps scoring opportunities. So it's well worth rehearsing your answers beforehand. An intelligent gate is where a patient tries to avoid weight bearing on the painful leg. There's a shortened stance phase of the affected limb with a leaning of the trunk over to the painful side. Some textbooks mention the leaning over to the trunk to the non-weight bearing side. This is wrong. The shifting of the center of gravity of the upper body to a position close to the femoral head reduces the counterbalancing forces required in the abductor muscles, thus dramatically reducing the compressive force across the painful hip joint. With a Trendelenburg gait, there's a drop of the pelvis on the opposite side to the affected stance limb. This also shifts the body's center of gravity over to the non-weight bearing side, but uh, that's dropped down. Uh, but the patient usually compensates and avoids falling over by shifting the upper body towards the weight bearing leg. This again, decreases the counterbalancing force that's needed to be exerted by the weakened abductor muscles. In the short leg gait, the patient will dip down on the short leg during the weight bearing on the affected leg. A short leg gait involves an excessive shift of the center of gravity towards the short side with a drop of the center of gravity. It differs from the intelligent gait in that um, the stance phase is equal, so there is a regular even dip on the shortened side. It's only apparent if the limb is shorter than two centimeters. With a stiff hip gait, the pelvis must be elevated by exaggerated plantar flexion of the opposite ankle and circumduction of the stiff leg to produce tall clearance. With a gluteus maximus gait, uh, the, the gluteus maximus contracts at heel strike 
and it slows forward motion of the trunk by arresting flexion of the hip and initiating extension. When the gluteus maximus is weak, the trunk lurches backwards at heel strike on the weakened side to interrupt forward motion of the trunk and shift the body center of gravity posterior to the hip joint. Moving on to Trendelenburg test. This is very important test. You must be at home with this. You must be able to demonstrate it slickly and smoothly in front of the examiners. You must be prepared to be grilled by them about what you're doing and why and the significance of a positive test. I think one of the key elements for the success of this is to first explain what you're going to do to the patient, then demonstrate it on yourself, position the patient correctly, and then perform the test. There are many ways to perform Trendelenburg test, as this slide demonstrates. Sometimes uh, the, the patient can place their hands on your shoulders, uh, elbows, or forearms. The examiner can be standing, uh, sitting in a chair, or kneeling down and the examiner can be feeling for the anterior superior spine or not feeling for that. The original test was described uh, posteriorly, watching the posterior superior spines move up and down the, uh, as the test was performed. Most of us feel better to and are more comfortable performing the test from the front. We think we can, it, it's more easy to, to, to see if the patient uh, is, is comfortable and they're not going to lose balance. You're also checking to see that they're not painful as well. Method one is, is good, where the patient places their hands on your shoulders and you feel the isis, and you get them to stand on the, the good leg first and then the uh, bad leg second. And you, you're looking to see if the pelvis drops down on the uh, opposite uh, non-weight bearing side to the leg that's weight bearing. Um, <clears throat> and this would suggest that there's abductor weakness. If all else fails and you get confused and your mind goes blank, just remember the sound side sags. Method two is in the chair. And that's actually very good in clinic. And lots of, uh, uh, lots of us do this in clinic. Uh, but the, the problem is that in the short cases, you may not have a chair available. And if you've only learned Trendelenburg test from a chair, it's difficult then to perform uh, the test uh, without previous practice standing up. Three uh, is more style over substance. Uh, you can explain what you the, the patient what you're doing to the patient uh, quite easily with the test, uh, and it looks good. You're not neat bending down, but we've seen this used uh, when there's been a mild Trendelenburg. Uh, weakness present and it's not picked up this so we, I wouldn't recommend method three and method four is um, I've seen it done method four and it's worked out okay but some of the old examiners don't like this test because you're staring into the groin and talking into the groin and also you may, might find uh, giving instructions to the patient difficult from this position I think the Trinellenberg test is more about being polished and, and choosing one method that works for you and getting good at this uh, and how you, you come across performing the test rather than absolute semantics. Uh, a true positive is due to a power lever arm or fulcrum failure. Power failure may be due to general muscle weakness or paralysis, a general neurological weakness or abductor dysfunction secondary to surgery, trochanteric osteotomy or superior gluteal nerve injury. Lever arm failure, that's just uh, force times distance, that's just biomechanics around the hip, shortened neck and coxivera, short neck from fractured neck ephema, perfus disease, and fulcrum's failures when there's instability due to destruction of the femoral head from septic arthritis or TB. A number of false positives can occur, uh, usually uh, secondary to pain from gluteal inhibition, from osteoarthritis or avascular necrosis, if pain is not considered true positive. Be aware of the false negatives with an arthrod eased or an enclosed hip. That's where the muscles are weakened, but because the hip, hip is stiff, it won't dip down. The test is invalid with generalized weakness, poor balance, lack of coordination, or if the patient's unable to understand instructions. Be aware of some trick movements that the patient can do. Um, they can shift the torso over to the weight-bearing side, so you ask them to stand up tall and straight with this. 
And they also can use the muscles above the pelvis. A lot of the patients cheat and they flex their hip. The hip shouldn't be flexed, it should be neutral. The knee should be flexed to, to 90 degrees. You ask the patient to kick the knee back, but make sure that they're not near a couch because it could hurt themselves. So after Trendelenburg test, you lie the patient down. And uh, it's important to square the pelvis. By squaring the pelvis, we mean that the ISIS are, are level and perpendicular to the couch. Scaring the pelvis is important because all measurements of asymmetry, deformity, and mile alignment of the legs are based on a squared pelvis. Make sure that the couch is flat uh, and there's not too many breaks or, uh, within the um, couch, although sometimes you're given what, whatever couch you're given. We confirm any previous findings, and sometimes it may be quite obvious that there's some muscle wasting or, or, or scars which you haven't previously seen. So I mentioned these as well. The difficulty with palpation is that the hip joint is too deep to assess for an effusion or a synovial thickening. However, um, it's important still to offer to perform palpation to the examiners. And in mind you say, don't bother, it's fine. Just, just continue as, as you are. Um, um, you might want to uh, palpate for any abnormal swellings or masses, feel for the skin temperature. There is a lump sign sometimes present, which is a dislocated femoral head anterior, anteriorly. There may be lymph nodes, hernias, or aneurysm, suggesting a general surgical cause for the um, pain that the patient may be presenting with. Bony landmarks, isis, gluteal tuberosity, ischial tuberosity can be felt. Moving on to Thomas test. This is another test that you must be completely comfortable performing and be able to demonstrate it both quickly and smoothly to the examiners. The test is usually well described by most candidates, but can be poorly performed under the pressure to perform the examination. The aim is to remove the compensatory lumbar lordosis so that any fixed flexion deformity of the hip becomes obvious. The couch should be flat, with ideally no break within the couch and a reasonably hard surface, but you're given what you're given. It's perhaps easy to perform the test kneeling down to the side of the couch rather than being standing up, bolt upright and looking uncomfortable. Place your left hand under the patient's lumbar spine. Ask the patient to fully flex up their hips and knees, and this will eliminate any lumbar lordosis. Perform the test on the good side first. Ask the patient to hold the affected limb with both hands, and with the other hand holding the good leg, control extension of this limb. Full extension is normally achieved with the lumbar lordosis still obliterated. If, the fixed flex, if there is a fixed flexion deformity, the patient will arch up their lumbar spine and the lumbar lordosis will reappear and pressure is relieved in your left hand. At the point when this pressure is relieved, bend the patient's knee so that their heel touches the couch and measure the angle between the couch and thigh, which is the angle of fixed deformity. There are a few caveats to this test. I can bet if there's 10 candidates that perform the test, one of you will forget to put your hand under the lumbar spine and to check that the lumbar lordosis has been flattened. This is quite a bad mistake to make. Another area is to be too gentle and not completely eliminate the lumbar lordosis by not flexing up the opposite hip far enough. The other side is to be too rough and flex up the pelvis so you get a uh, error in overestimating fixed flexion deformity of a hip. With the opposite side, two problems. One, they could have a painful arthrosis on the opposite side, so be careful you don't hurt the patient. And if they've had a total hip replacement on the opposite side, be careful because you, you don't want to dislocate the hip and in most situations, you will not perform the test in this situation. The last is just really semantics and it's for the hardcore candidate. Some suggestion that you should place your dorsum of your hand beneath the lumbar spine rather than the palmar aspect of your hand because it's more sensitive and you can feel when this pressure is immediately released from your hand. But I, I think that's splitting hairs and I'm not sure you'd, you'd be asked about this. Moving on to hip movements. Hip movements are probably the most important clinical sign and the key to the diagnosis of hip disease. 
We measure active movements first and then continue on with passive movements afterwards for ease and speed of examination. Always keep the patient's face under observation to avoid distressing them and the examiners. If movements are severely restricted in all directions, think of rheumatoid arthritis, septic arthritis or tuberculosis. If hip movements are reasonably well preserved, but there's terminal pain and limitation of lim movement, think of osteoarthritis. If one or more movements are more limited than others in certain positions, then the head is deformed and think of such conditions as perfis or avascular necrosis. Flexion of the hip can be measured as part of Thomas' test, but I, I separate the two as it's less complicated and confusing for myself to do it this way. So unless you're very good at practice and feel very confident, I would suggest you keep the two separate. Uh, ex internal external rotation and flexion, that's the GP type test, but be careful that you don't mix the two things up. Internal rotation occurs when the foot turns out, external rotation occurs when the foot turns in. And you might get confused because of the way the foot moves laterally externally, hip rotates internally. So don't get them mixed up in the stress of the clinicals. External rotation and flexion is usually greater 50 degrees than internal rotation, which is around 40 degrees, except in cases of excessive femoral antiversion. Moving on to abduction, it's important to stabilize the pelvis with both abduction and adduction because it's suggested that if you don't do so, you can overestimate range of movement in the hip by over 50%. With adduction, um, true adduction can only be measured if the contralateral leg is in a position of abduction. If it's in neutral, like the first slide, then the degree of pelvic tilt comes into play as the examiner's leg is crossed over the contralateral static hip. With extension, we don't tend to do this in clinic. It's usually elderly patients and they'll struggle to get over onto their uh, uh, abdomen. Um, and it's just difficult at times, but you want to mobilize the pelvis with one hand while extending the hip and the other, and the range of movement is zero to 30 degrees. Moving on to leg lengths. If there is a leg length discrepancy, you want to move on to measurements of true and apparent shortening. With apparent shortening, there's no need to square the pelvis. It's a functional leg that you're, length that you're measuring. With true leg lengths, you need to square the pelvis. So if you start with an apparent first, the patient should be in a straight line with limbs parallel, deformity is not corrected. And you choose a fixed midline point to the medium malleolus. Uh, and apparently shows the compensation that the patient's developed to conceal any true deformity. It's the uh, amount of true shortening plus the apparent shortening together. So it's measured from the ziphi sternum, which is a fixed central point to the medium malleolus. Uh, you need to make sure that you've used the tape measure before. Don't just do this for the third or fourth time in your life because it's quite obvious in the clinicals that that will be the case. Make sure that your tape measure is sturdy, it's not paper and it's long enough. If the patient's quite a long patient, sometimes the tape measure can end up being short. Some textbooks measure the, mention the umbilicus as a, as a point to, to measure, but this is not fixed and it can be diseased or, or altered uh, contour from surgery. With true shortening, it's, it's, it's shortening of the affected limb, which is physically shorter than the other leg. This may be above or below the trochanters in the femur, tibia, or occasionally the foot. Measurement is taken from the isis to the medium malleolus, while the lower limbs are in identical positions and the pelvis has been squared. If there's deformity in one leg, the other leg must be placed in an identical position. And again, make sure you look as though you've used the tape measure before. Make sure that the tape measure is not one of these paper ones that's going to tear and make sure it's long, long enough, as we've mentioned, as you look daft. Ideally, the measurement should be from the center of the femoral head because this is the normal axis of the hip movement. However, there's no surface landmark. The nearest fixed point is the ACES and we choose this. 
hook your thumbs up uh, so that you accurately define the ACES point. As if you don't do this, you can easily get the, the measurements wrong um, in the opposite sides, especially if the patient's obese. Choose a fixed point for the medium myeliolus again. I choose inferiorly rather than centrally because it's more consistent. If you measure, if you look at the leg length, so you've sh shown a shortening, quickly move on to Galeazzi's test. This test will demonstrate whether the shortening is in the femur or the tibia. You want to flex the hips up to 45 degrees and the knees up to 90 degrees. And you comment on whether the knees are level or at a different level. So with femoral shortening, the knee is more proximally located. With tibial shortening, the knee is at a lower level. Make a big play of looking at the legs and the knees from the end of the bed and from the side of the bed. Galaxy's test is usually straightforward, except you can sometimes come across some tricky cases. This lady's polio disease, you would expect the whole leg to be withered on the right side, so a shortened tibia and a shortened femur. However, as the scars show, she's had some lengthening on the tibia, so the, the leg of those weak, weight wasted and there's lack of muscle compared to the opposite side, it's longer and the femur is shortened. So you just got to be careful. These are tricky conditions, which if you know about them beforehand and you've thought through and worked out your, your approach, then you're okay. But if you're coming across them for the first time, uh, then it can be very tricky. The other classic is a club foot uh, patient that's got an, a severe club foot that's affecting the um, lower leg that may have been lengthened, or there may be epiphysiodesis on the opposite side to, to reduce the, 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 the leg length inequality. If you find shortening in the femur, then move on to Bryant's test. Bryant's test is something which I don't think you'd be asked to draw out, but you may need to be able to describe the test and its significance. Um, so one point is the anterior superior leg spine, and you drop a line from the anterior superior leg spine onto the edge of the couch. Second line from the greater trochanter goes upwards to meet with point with the first line at point C. So it's an isosceles triangle, which is um, compared both sides, and you're looking for subtrochanteric shortening uh, or the x distance to be shortened. There is an approximation where the thumb can be placed over the anterior superior iliac spines. Um, main finger over the greater trochanter and your index finger over the um, level C. And you're looking to, to see if the, the, the triangles are, 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 are um, equivalent. It's not a good test if there's shortening on both sides. If there is, shortening then you can go on and perform Nalato's line. You have the affected limb uppermost with the hip flexed to 90 degrees and a tape measure is stretched across the initial tuberosity to the anterior superior leg spine. The greater trochanter should lie on or above this line. If it's if the femur is above it's been displaced proximally. There are a number of uh, miscellaneous tests which you may be asked about and if you're very unlucky you'll be asked to demonstrate. Craig's test uh, is used to estimate the amount of femoral antiversion pre present. There's a piriform test um, and the, there's now more common impingement tests for labral pathology. Anterior posterior impingement and Faber test. And you may be asked contractures as part of a um, GP patient, Orbus test, Elise test, and Phelps test. With an anterior impingement test, it, it's a sensitive test to reveal intraarticular pathology in a particular torn anterior superior acetabulum labrum. With the patient supine, the hip is flexed 90 degrees and then adducted and internally rotated. A positive test reproduces the patient's pain in the hip or the groin. Positive tests may be sometimes accompanied with crepitus, clicking or a popping sensation. This test compresses the anterior surface of the labrum. With a posterior impingement test, it's helpful in demonstrating any disease between the posterior 
acetabular wall and femoral neck. Patient lies supine on the edge of the couch with the affected leg dangling. Contralateral leg is held in flexion while the examiner fully externally rotates the affected hip while abducting and externally rotating the leg. The Faber test is used to, to, to distinguish between um, pain arising from the sacroiliac joint and pain arising from the posterior aspect of the, the, the hip. Patient lies supine. We place the ipsilateral foot on the contralateral knee, so-called figure of four position. Ipsilateral leg is allowed to relax. And the leg will be seen to drop toward, downwards to a varying degree. When this end point has been reached, the examiner places one hand on the flexed knee and the other hand on the isis and presses down. Increasing pain uh, can be elicited if there's disease present and different locations account for different disease processes such as the sacroiliac joint or posterior aspect of the hip. There is the Faber distance, which is the distance between the couch and the knee, um, which gives you some idea of um, the, the movement within the hip. Neely's test is next. This test evaluates for tight rectus femoris. Patient lies prone, the knee is passively flexed, the rectus femoris, if contracted, uh, the patient's hip on the same side will flex up. Normally, the hip will remain flat against the examining couch. With Ober's test, this evaluates for contraction of the iliotibial band. Patient lies on the unaffected side. The unaffected hip is maximally flexed to flatten any lumbar load or cis present. The affected hip is flexed and abducted 45 degrees. Hip is then slowly extended. Normally when bringing the hip towards the midline, it's possible to abduct the hip. If the leg is abducted still, it's suggestive of an earlier tibial band contracture. Uh, Phelps test is next, and this tests for the presence of a tight gracilis. Uh, further flexion, um, sorry, further abduction of the hip is possible on flexing the knee. Abductor muscle power, you can go on to test for this if you expect, if you're worried about uh, loss of abductor muscle, bulk, and weakness. Engages test is test for uh, um, femoral antiversion. One hand should be, patient should be prone, one hand over the greater trochanter, and you rotate the leg until the trochanter is at its most prominent. Piriformis test. You may generally be asked to describe the test rather than probably perform it, but patient usually lies with the affected side uppermost, hip is flexed up to 60 degrees, knee at 90, and one hand stabilizes the pelvis, the other hand abducts the, the, the flexed hip. And this stretches the piriformis muscle, and the positive test occurs with pain along the cytic nerve distribution. There are some special situations such as ankylosed hip, fused hip or fused knees and you need to be aware of what you're doing in this situation and also if there's a valgus knee or a flex tip how to measure leg lengths. Don't forget uh, lumbar spine and knee examination, distal neurovascular status, thank the patient at the hand and wash your hands. Thanking you.